the last piece of work I was involved in was a commission in Bergen. And I was invited to put forward a proposal for four hemlock trees that had been cut down. I had the trunks, that is it, that's fast, that's permanent. Here, I don't have anything like that. And now I have to begin to, I have to think on my feet <laughs> because I don't have this tree trunk that someone's asked me to work on. I'm thinking, well, what is it I'm gonna work on and what am I gonna find? It's not easy, it's difficult. For me now, having done a lot of works in the past, you've been given the basis of what it is and then you have to transform it. Now I have to do everything from the ground up. My name is Stuart Ian Frost. I'm a British environmental artist based in Norway. I'm here in Southwest Australia to do works related to the environment. So it's a very exciting time and in the last week I've spent traveling down from Perth, stopping in, in different locations and looking for materials that are specific to specific areas. Often I would be looking for things where there's an abundance of something, an abundance of something that I've not seen before and that would then give me a clue to the next stage in the process and the next stage in the process is often to take or gather a number of items or materials back, look at them and study them not just sort of visually but also through drawing and thinking how they relate to and what they might be have been used for culturally, religiously, oh, there's so many different aspects you can look at with these materials but what I like to do is put them together in a different form so that when you when you look at something you'd look at probably the form as as opposed to the material although it's from a material you don't actually see what it's from so you have to start studying things i want people to start studying something that they haven't studied before which is in their backyard basically i don't know how it's going to work but i'm not say i haven't done it i have done it before and i think that this might then create new areas for me to to pursue again and maybe something that i've left that I shouldn't have left and I shouldn't have been pushed into an area <laughs> that perhaps this possibility could um, enhance the other part of my praxis. When I first um, started working with or within a landscape, I remember that I felt that I needed the security of lots of tools. So I'd load up a van and drive off and I'd have it in the back of my mind that all the time I had these tools I should use because I'd driven off with so much stuff and equipment. And I'd walk off with a heavy load, um, not knowing exactly what I was gonna do. And always in my mind, was going, what am I going to use this hammer for? What am I going to use that for? And in the end, it, I found that things were getting in the way. And I've approached this residency in exactly the same way, that I've stripped away all those things. All I took was a ruler, a few pencils, and the very basics things like string and stuff. I mean, I know you can probably get that here, but I felt then comfortable with that. And it's the things that I use um, more often than not, because you can, you can acquire other things when you need it. And I remember when, I, when I'd done that and taken that decision, early on in my career, that if I needed to knock something into the ground, I wouldn't use a hammer. I'd make a hammer or I'd use a stone. And I'm thinking pretty much similar in a similar way here. So what I'm gonna try and do is um, use basic things and make things and make it from what's available there and then. And then I think it'll become more part of the place.
I think my first impressions of Albany are obviously the ones that you get from the coast, which is why in the beginning I, I started working with um, materials that were found and washed up on the coast. And then moving inland, you get farmland, you get small bush areas, and then again, going further afield, you get into the Prongerup and the Stirling Mountains. So you've got these changes, and I think that's been nice. I mean, when I originally came, I had a, a view up in from Torbay over the over the bay, but I also had a view of the Prongerup and the Stirlings on a good day. So all these things, I think, have been in my head, and they've been something I've wanted to do in all areas. I wanted to do something from each place. So I think originally my idea was to maybe have this coastal type of working, then a little bit inland where the farmland might be and then further afield up into the more mountainous and more um, bush areas. So I've tried to work with the different environments using materials and taking things from there that are particular to each individual area that we can see around us. There are some extremely interesting locations but often if it's that interesting maybe you should leave it alone because how are you going to do anything and make it any better, leave it for everybody else. And I think that's something I've seen here as well, and an appreciation of something. I think you appreciate it and that's it, leave it. I'd like to do something where I perhaps take more places that are perhaps have got no great special interest and try and turn them into something that's more special and more interesting for people to appreciate on that level. Because often people go past things and never see it in that way. You put something there or change it slightly, suddenly their impression or their the way that they look at it has changed and then they start opening their eyes again to things. So that is also a lot about what I, I do. This is an amazing tree. Inside there's these huge lumps of resin. There's a bit there as well. It's obviously, I don't know if that happens when it's been burnt, that the resin actually congeals into these globules. And in fact, you can see a lot of it actually here, more at the base. Oh, I can probably take one off and have a look. I can get it, oh yeah, I did get it off. I think if you bash it around, oh yeah, that shows you the sort of, perhaps the true color of it. It's pretty hard, almost like, glass you'll hear it there interesting stuff maybe it's possible to collect a lot of that to, and do something with it hmm. you can see actually how the tree itself this grass tree is made up of these individual little stalks here it reminds me of something, I can't quite put my finger on it, what it is, but it's, it's, it almost feels as well when you touch this, that it's got some type of varnish on it. Thing is, it's so amazing as it is, I don't know what you could do to it to, to, to make it even more impressive. The problem I think with the grass trees is, is that it's something that every, everybody's going to be attracted to because they're so different. And you think, well, could I do something with that? They are what they are for a reason, and maybe that's enough. I don't think I can do a lot to them to make them any more interesting than they already are. So I'm a bit wary if I do something to it because I'm sure there's been people here that have used the grass trees for something or parts of grass trees for something. If I do something with that, I don't want people to go and say, ah, that's made of grass trees. It's obvious. I want to do something that says, this is art and this isn't a grass tree or this isn't something that's made from that. I want to disguise it in such a way or to alienate it so that people won't see it's that. Then maybe they can see the way or approach the tree in the way that I first did. not far from the coast, I think it was an hour's drive inland, there's a series of salt lakes. There seem to be hundreds of them. And you don't get a scale of these uh, salt lakes, but and the colors of them, some of them were shown in pink, 
um, obviously white because of the salt, as you'd expect. Um, and today I had the opportunity to go and see one of these, not far from the roadside, amazing. It was almost like snow, <laughs> just it's just spectacular to look at this thing. And I mean, you just sort of think, I wonder if I can capture something to enhance it. Maybe you can't, maybe it's just the fact that you've been there and seen it is enough. You see this salt lake, you think it's gonna be completely hard and flat. You start walking on it and suddenly you start walking in a different way. It's almost like you're on the moon or something. It's not because you've landed on the moon, but it's just the fact that, the, that underneath this crystallized salt on the surface, there is a black gunge or like mud. And it, you, the further out you go into the middle of the lake, the, the deeper you seem to tread and the more of a mark you make. And I'd seen marks from, I believe it was kangaroos and maybe emus had walked on this particular salt lake. But it, it was fascinating. And another thing that I noticed also were thousands of shells, small spiral shells, not much bigger than maybe a centimetre in length, all around the edge of this salt lake. But it has given me something to think about. And I think that will be something that is going to get me going and spark my creativity. So I've collected a lot of paperback. And paper bark in itself was something that Albany was quite known for because I think before the first settlers came that the, the actual town was covered in paper box. So I've used this material. I've not used it before. It's very, it's pliable. I mean, I like the idea that it was paper. So I've tried to do something with it. So I've rolled it up and then I've wired it together. I've um, I made a, a type of form. I was going to make a three dimensional form, but I found that you really need to know exactly what it can do. I mean, I know originally the Aboriginals would have used the paper bark to make huts with. Make that, so they would have used bit. this because the material is watertight. Wow. So they would have made a, a quick shelter and put this over. I wanted to do something else with it. So I've rolled this up to start with. And the rolls in themselves are almost like cores of paper that you would find when you record things. And as we know that the Aboriginal languages and things weren't recorded in written form. So it had something to do with that. It was like a play with the material plus the, you know, the things that I found down here. I've put this into, into a form that was about 137 by 190, the size actually of, a, of an average bed. And afterwards I felt it wasn't, it wasn't working well enough and I wanted to do something else to it. So I've made some forms and I have created a, a method of um, branding them. So I've marked this and branded it. So it's almost like a, a recognition of something or ownership. And then this piece of work has been put out back into the environment and photographed from there. If I talk about the documentation of the paper bark work, I mean, that Salt Lake has always been the back of my mind and I wanted to not leave here before I'd done something or had some connection with it again. The location that uh, we'll put the paper bark on was surprising when we visited it um, recently because it was completely clear. I could walk right to the middle of it. The salt was extremely hard and quite pink, but visiting it yesterday, it was covered in water which was quite a surprise to me. But in a sense, they had to use the fact that it had water on it, which gave reflections and another dimension in a sense that wasn't obvious. And I think maybe having made this form and making this what could be seen as a bed and putting it on the paper bark and in relation to, to the elder that used to live there nearby, I felt it was like, <laughs> this is my place. <laughs> this is where, where my bed is, so, that type of thing. So you, it could be read in different ways.
here I am sitting on this piece of jarrah. It's uh, a hardwood, but this is something I've not come up against before. This is pretty hard. I mean, it, it takes quite nicely to the tools I've got, so it, it's not it's not impossible to work, of course. But what I liked about this particular piece was, once it's now been cleaned up, you see the movement in the wood here. So it's something I want to work with. It's almost like a like a rock or a boulder, which is what I like. And it's almost got that type of weight as well. You can imagine how heavy this thing is. It's not something you could move easily. I'm gonna do something to it that's related to this, this particular place and area. And it might be more related perhaps to this particular piece of wood here. So I'm actually looking forward to getting the whole thing cleaned up, mark it out and start drilling. And should work out really nicely. Looking forward to that. The work from Jarrah is, um, uh, for me, it's quite interesting because the whole thought about coming to Australia, there is all these amazing hardwoods, something that I've never worked with before. And having worked with a lot of woods in different countries, it seemed to be, for me, something that I, it was a must in a sense, to be able to understand why things were made like they were, why tools were produced like they were, and whether it was possible for me to actually be able to do something with this wood. Looking at it originally, it looked like it had been stood around for quite some time because there was moss and different bits on it. But I mean, I, I had a feeling that once it was cleaned up, it would it'd be something else. And once it was brought back to the shed that I've been working in, and I've got a chainsaw on it and started to grind it back, I saw that there was this really nice, almost copper color or this bright reddish color to it. It also has a lot of um, cracks in it, but not cracks that were so deep that it made it impossible for me to work with it. I then was thinking about some imagery that could put on it that was specific to Australia. And that then was this image that I remembered of these double Gs. It's a little weed, I guess, and the, the, the seed from it has got three or four points on it that can get into hooves of animals, etc. And they're very, very difficult. In fact, it's much impossible to get out of the land once you get in there. So I wanted to make a comment about that. So I've actually cleaned, as I said, this piece of jarrah, tried to keep as much of the volume as I could, but to change it from looking like a tree stump into more of like an organic boulder form. And then I've drilled a number of holes on it to um, indicate that that was in relationship to these double G forms. I've burnt them and then I've sanded it back again. So you get this contrast of this very deep black. And again, the black is also to do with the fact that you see all around us bushfires and things like that. So you get remnants of this blackness in this particular form. Obviously, when we we're going to have to move this piece, we needed some help. And the tractor that we had just about managed to lift this over the field, which was a slow process. In fact, we could walk quicker than the tractor, but the uneven ground meant the, the fact that the tractor had to move pretty slowly. It would have been maybe ideal if the wood had been here. <laughs> then it, but then the wood, if the wood had been here, it would have taken on a different form. But to actually move it is something that um, wasn't something I thought too much about in the beginning, but fortunately we've got the possibilities to do it, but not in an ideal way. But it's, you often come back to this type of idea that you, if, if you knew what you were doing before you started, you perhaps wouldn't have done it. And then how are you gonna do it once you've done it? So you always have to, this compromises all the way. So the compromise was is to see how it was possible to move this large lump of wood somewhere where visually it was going to work and make some comment. Um, unfortunately, it does work extremely well in this area, but there's, it's not just, it doesn't just appear. There's a lot of things, I think, also behind artworks and everything like that. It, things aren't just, they just don't appear. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of other things involved and it takes a lot of care and attention to, to put things down. Things aren't just picked up. There's a lot of um, effort involved. The works that I've managed to achieve would actually not have been possible if I hadn't been fortunate enough to meet Kevin Draper and his partner Indra because they gave me the possibility to work in a workshop 
where they had all the facilities that actually an artist needs. I think without that, I would have been very limited as to what I could have achieved with the small amount of tools that I was able to bring with me and what I've purchased in that time. And also another person that has been very helpful is Harley Coyne from the Heritage and Cultural Department in Albany. And without him and the contacts he's put me in touch with, I think again, it would have been virtually impossible really to have achieved anything with the, with the natural materials that I've used and also to, to be taken to sites and to, to learn about um, the Aboriginal culture from somebody here that's obviously direct contact with it. So I'm very grateful for all these people. To conclude uh, my time in um, Albany or this part of the country, what I thought in the beginning hasn't turned out to what I've found out in the end, <laughs> which is good. I didn't come with any preconceived notions, but you obviously come with something, you come with some idea. I mean, it sounds awful, but I think when I first arrived, I was disappointed. I don't know why, <laughs> probably what I was expecting so much. But now that I'm here, I'm thinking, there's so much more here, why do I have to go? <laughs> I've only just started to understand everything and how much time was good to spend on making as to how much time was good to spend on, you know, building up knowledge that could be used. But at the same time, you know, it's having that combination of things. How do you justify putting that much time into that as against that and how do the two things combine? I think I've, I think I've done it reasonably well. I mean, and if I came back, then I'd know immediately what I would like to pursue and what area I'd go in. But I think three months, in any case, is far too short <laughs> in a place that's this big with so much to offer. There's so much more here, I'm, I'm well aware of that. So the place is exciting and I can begin to understand perhaps a little bit more about why it's called the Great Southern.